first and foremost, I see myself as a historian, uh, as a social historian in my case of 17th century Italy. Uh, my particular research interests lie in relationships of conflict mostly. Uh, so I look a lot at violence and I look at crime, uh, but I also look uh, at, at relationships of love and peace, right? So I'm interested in family life as well. Uh, I'm interested in domestic life. I'm interested in how cities work and how people get along in them. Um, as, a, as a digital scholar, uh, I, I try to get at those questions by employing uh, digital innovative methods that allow us to answer traditional historical questions using uh, new modes and also that might prompt new historical questions as well. During my master's um, at Dalhousie University, I spent a month and a half in my supervisor's attic uh, tracing maps of the Po Valley out of modern maps and then reducing all of the modern riverways and cities out of them until I had uh, hand-drawn traced maps of 17th century Parma. Um, after my master's thesis, I swore that I would never do that again. Uh, and when I started my PhD, I, uh, the first summer after my PhD, I went to the Digital Humanities Summer Institute out at the University of Victoria, which is a sort of educational clearinghouse for, for learning about digital skills that you can use as a humanities scholar. Um, so that was my sort of first introduction was, was trying to do spatial humanities without the digital assistance um, and, and being very frustrated and, and finding that they're thinking that there must be a more efficient way to, 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 to do that, to make maps. I think that the most important questions that historians can ask, uh, as, as people who are, as, as academics who are generally interested in the activities of people and the experiences of people, um, is are, are questions about relationships, uh, questions about how relationships are affected by both physical and ritual space, and, and how relationships operate across different kinds of spaces. So the questions that I like to ask are, for instance, what is the relationship between uh, the built environment of a street and the passage of a plague through that, uh, through that neighborhood, for instance, right? And then when you start asking these questions, you can start placing historical experience, human experience, into physical landscapes in a way that we've lost previously and we're now able to recover them using tools such as historical GIS to, to re-imagine the, the experienced life of the street in the, in the early modern world. when we're looking at property values, I mean, we could have, without the digital view, we can go through the through the source that we use and we could, through our own work, uh, do an analysis of property values that would be a tabular uh, result. We would have, we would be able to present lots of tables and charts and graphs, but we wouldn't know where those houses were. And we, we couldn't spatialize that that analysis of house value. So bringing it into a, into a cartographic field, into GIS, allows us to make the relationship between, say, property value and place and location explicit uh, for the early modern world. <laughs> One of the uh, most difficult and sort of the most obvious problem that we had uh, bringing early modern sources into a modern uh, frame of analysis was, was the nature of the data. Um, GIS programs and, and spatial humanities programs generally, spatial analysis generally, um, as well as database programs generally, uh, require hard data, discrete bits of data that can be reduced to their smallest possible uh, content. Um, early modern data is not like that. It it, is, uh, it, it, it can be non-standardized within a single source. Um, so for instance, in the four volumes of the census that we work with, it is consistent, you know, it is pretty well standardized, but only after about halfway through the process. So the first two volumes of the document are, are the scribes uh, finding their method and, and refining and then formalizing their method. And there's only hard consistency by, by volume three. Um, the other major problem where this emerged was then in uh, in spatializing all of our, our, our database. Um, 16th century Florence did not have numbered addresses for their houses, did not have numbered streets. Uh, so we had to determine a method that would allow us to at least um, make a representationally accurate picture of the census on top of the city, even if it means that not every single dot is on top of every single exact house, but we have them in the right order and spatially proportional to one another in terms of where neighbors are, in terms of uh, which neighborhood people are are in.
I think one of the, the greatest things that we can put into it is, is the people, is, is humans. Um, GIS began as, a, as an environmental science. Uh, it, was, it was invented by Environment Canada um, in order to do Arctic research, in fact. So to that end, most of its professional development as a, as a program and as a, as a cartographic field has been uh, done by, by environmental scientists um, and, and by landscapers, by geography. Uh, historians can bring, um, or humanities scholars can bring humanist issues into it. We can ask about the relationship between people's lives and space. Uh, we can ask about the relationships between um, the, the experiences of, um, of plague, of warfare, of, uh, of poverty, and, and space uh, in a way that, that scientists are not necessarily going to do. Um, and I think that that is extremely valuable for deepening our understanding of the relationship between human experience and the places in which it occurs. I will admit that I am slightly skeptical of the of the potential for revolution here. Uh, I think that there will be some seismic changes that it makes to to our method and how we how we interpret our role as as humanists. Uh, I think one of the things that it's going to do is it's going to force a lot more collaboration among humanist scholars, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about collaboration later, I'm sure. Uh, but but I think in terms of its potential to overhaul the entire field, I think we need to remember that we're still going to be asking many of the same. questions questions. Uh, our experience with, with spatial humanities will prompt new questions and it will prompt us to reconsider some old questions, but we need to maintain that fundamental basis of rigorous humanist scholarship uh, at, the, at, the, at the lowest level in order for any digital scholarship to improve that, that humanist scholarship. If we throw the baby out with the bathwater, then, uh, then we're losing the, the war there, or the battle. We want to keep the humanities in digital humanities. greatest obstacle probably to be overcome is is simple uh, fear. Um, a lot of scholars are wary of um, of digital methods because they're not quite sure how to use them and they're not quite sure if they're using them appropriately and I think that is a problem that is going to be solved uh, organically um, as more and more people attend um, attend things like DHSI as more and more people are able to take advantage of their own schools uh, digital humanities course offerings um, most GIS libraries for instance offer uh, regular introduction to GIS courses um, so I think that the the the, tech, the the skills barrier is going to be overcome pretty quickly uh, and pretty organically. The other difficulty and the other sort of challenge to overcome is a, uh, a distrust of numbers and hard analysis among humanists. As, as humans, we know that, that we're deeply interested in um, what people might call soft data and, and in relationships and in uh, more abstract processes that, that often we're not quite sure how we can make those concrete using digital tools. Um, that's a larger challenge to overcome, but again, one that I think will be, will, will be overcome more organically as, uh, as more and more graduate students are digital natives and are uh, already familiar with digital tools and then are more open to the idea that they can be used um, to explicate Shakespeare, for instance. There's a few pointers um, on, on how we do that, and I think what you, you say edutainment, and I think that's one of the, 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 the interesting words, is that we're seeing that digital brings, um, digital clouds all of the borders formerly between entertainment, between education, between scholarship. Uh, so one of the things that we're going to need to reconsider is, is how scholarship is produced. What is the gold standard of, of produced knowledge, right? Will it be the monograph? Uh, there will always be room for the historical monograph, for for instance, right, or, or for the dissertation. However, if, if there are supplementary or alternative formats that can be introduced um, to the to the dissertation or monograph, where the the hard labor that goes into the digital portion of the project is recognized as the uh, as humanities training, then um, that's that's something that we're probably going to see happening in the next ten years. I would say is that the 
the way that we train graduate students and expect faculty to engage with scholarship is going to be um, transformed in ways that I'm not entirely sure of yet. Yeah, it's great. The AHA has just set up some guidelines for evaluation. Mm -hmm. For yeah, for tenure evaluation for digital projects, right? And that's that's something that we've been looking for, and that's something that was really scaring off a lot of young faculty from the digital humanities was that it was, well, where's the payoff, right? If this doesn't help me get tenure, why am I, why am I spending countless hours building this database? Uh, and it's really great that AHA has come out with these guidelines because they provide a sort of um, a base from which people can can at least evaluate the work of their colleagues. Great.